welcome to Blank Shadows Theatre Company, where we delight in bringing theatre to you. Welcome to the show. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. And without further ado, a flame in sickness. It was a Thursday morning when Dad had us up to work in the fields, bringing cattle from one field to the next, and having to help Sonny with mending his wall. Sonny was in his 70s, but still called by that variation of junior, as he came from a long line of boys doomed to be called Sonny, and that is kept even to this day. I walked my brothers to school, Mark, Malachi, and David. Malachi and David are twins. As we reached the school, I saw a looming figure that the man God supposedly ran his fingers through. His name, Father O'Rourke. His bulldog grin, welcoming children in as he slurred whiskey from his unshaven mouth. For the children to get in as quick as they could, smacking them over the head as they walked in. And none dared look at him, or else they will feel God's fingers sting their faces through the holy man's fist. There was nothing to be said in those times. No other help to seek from other sources. Only a silence that can't speak. As I walked away from the school, I ran home in the biggest hurry I could. A hare couldn't catch me with my quickness, as I knew I only had so long. The radio was the best invention in my time. It was like an earwig to the world as putting a glass to a door and listening for every word. In my house, the radio was on only two times a day news and death notices, and no one put it on for any other reason, or else my father would be sooner rid of you than to have to use the radio for anything more than finding out who stopped smoking. He always said it every time someone had passed on. God rest him, Mary, I knew him well. Or he wasn't looking the best, and I know why now. So for me to run as fast as I could into my house to get even five minutes of listening to music, five minutes to dance, nothing organized, graceful, or even good. Just me in a place and music. I loved it, and I blame my mother. She was the one who introduced me to traditional music and taught me how to dance to it. And when I heard music could be played on the radio, I experimented with changing the knobs. But I had to be careful and know where it was so Dad would not cop on to the notion of someone changing the channel. And so I would memorize the numbers. 88, 90, 88, 90, 88, 90. And then I hear it through the rain of crackle. I found my music. I found him. As soon as I heard the tune, the rhythm, I danced like my mother never taught me, or never wanted to see. Waving my arms about, jumping up and down, and singing that you couldn't do with a lot of trad. But with this, it was new. It was somewhat simple of a tune, but that's what I loved. The simplicity of hearing a melody that anyone could get, know, and sing. It's genius, I thought, and I have to let people hear it. I have to let people know about this artist. How are people so deaf and blind? My mother was a saint in looks and name. Mary, the holiest of names there is. She loved the brown hair that had a rough yet managed look to it. And even though she didn't smile much, she was considered a cheerful one at the time. She taught me how to cook, sew, and clean, and how to maintain a household. And when I was old enough and could take care of the house on my own, it meant that she could take a part-time job at McGurty's local shop. She would work weekends, 9 to 12. Maliki was stabbed with a pitchfork two months back. He suffered punctures, but was saved by Nancy up the road. She was taught nursing by Dr. Gaynor in Ballyshannon. She worked as a clerk there for two years and learned basic medical care. Maliki was dragged onto our kitchen table, squealing like a pig that is drained for our survival. 
with the stains of a red evening on our cotton sheet that paled, with the red dew pouring from his abdomen. Maliki was a difficult child, as Father O'Rourke said to my parents. Too much talk out of him, doesn't study his work, he said with a hissing of drunkenness coming from his mouth, as if he's just about sober to talk to people. Maliki would come home most days with his back scarred and his shins blistered, caused by a lack of concentration, and for any child who had to tell their parents that they were hit by a priest, and it was not for listening. Dad would grab his belt and hit Maliki more. How dare you disrespect him, you little pup! What caused this horrific attack on Maliki? Well, it was our little David who stuck him with it. We found him crying in a barn with a bloody pitchfork beside him, holding on to a cross that he had clutched in his hand, like a key that would unlock a door to safety of heaven's arms like a babe to a mother's breasts, promising warm milk and cotton sheets. David was severely punished in what was the cruelest punishment at that time, but no one knew what the consequences were, and that was to become an altar boy. Every Sunday, do mass, and every wedding and funeral he'd have to attend, and do extra work. Obviously, he was severely beat with my father's belt for doing such an act towards blood, in an unreasonable manner, as Maliki put it, but David was quiet as to why as if he did see his wrongs and regrets, and was willing to ask for forgiveness through penance and prayer. With this, I had more time for music, as I only had Mark to walk to school. As Maliki rested and David worked with the priest to clean his soul. I was discovering a world outside of Glenade and what it had to offer to me. I even got Maliki into the radio. He loved to listen. Every day he'd pray for his wound to heal so that he could move to the music. He said one day that I was like a flame moving with the wind on a cold, windy night, comforting and chilling from the breeze of reality I gave him. I was surprised at his comment. It seemed poetic, nearly, thought out and drafted, until it was just where he wanted it. I felt now, after a bit of time, Maliki could open up more as to why David attacked him, as he seemed so standoffish about it. He'd just sit there, cutting the spuds for dinner with Ma in the evening. He said only just a few words of saying, I was talking to David, and next thing he stabs me. He seems nervous answering, so I stop, and go to the radio to find something that will relieve his burden, if such a song exists. Another morning of cattle work with Da, and it's the first time Maliki is out of the house, on his feet. There was tension between David and Maliki, like a beating feeling of the sun weighing in on our shoulders, as if Atlas was to be given a crueler punishment. Soon, when it was just me, Maliki and David, Dad and Mark had gone off to Pat McGurn's field to help mend a wall, while we tended to watching our cattle and donkey. Maliki and David were holding the donkey when an argument had started. Hold the rope right, said Maliki. I am, you just worry about your side, said David. Knock it off, you two, there's already an arse in here, there's no need for two more. After a bit of bickering between them, I was sick of it, so I yelled, I can't take it. David, why did you stab Maliki with a pitchfork? Why? David breaks down crying. 
I don't know, I was just angry, that's all. Angry? You nearly killed him. David starts to choke slowly on his breath. I didn't mean to. David, tell me. I sometimes have this voice, this overwhelming sense of hurting someone or myself. Father O'Rourke says I just need to pray more, and so I do. I pray every day so that the demons and evil thoughts just go away. Oh, David, I did not know. Yeah, I didn't know how mad you are. Hey, watch it, I said. You're not big enough for a slap. Well, it's true. Listen to him. He's mad. He'd be better off with those nutters in town. At this moment, David snaps and lunges at Malachi with a firm fist, like one with a just cause behind it, as if it felt vengeful, the first hit to the left jaw. Malachi was pinned to the ground as David had used all he could know that could hurt a man. I tried to pull him off, but I couldn't budge him. He was like a tick. I thought I had to bury my brother right then and there in this field where he lay now beaten. Stop it, you two! Dear Christ, grow up! I want this all gone. This stops here, in this field. Now get up, the pair of you! Father O'Rourke visited me a week later, banging on our door like a sergeant. I opened it and he let himself in. He was checking up on me as I did not attend mass this Sunday, and was seeing what the emergency was of why I was not there. I told him he could ask Dr. Gaynor of why I was not there. How dare you answer me like that, you little pup. Your father will hear about your immaturity. I'll let him zeal with you. His speech is slurred now as it gets longer into the year and his whiskies get stronger and stronger. He slammed the door behind him and with that, I fell to my bedside weak. Dr. Gaynor had visited me. I had a fever for two days and haven't been able to eat or keep anything down. Too sick to walk anywhere and I feel like I'm going to pass out. So I've been here. He said it could just be something slight and that there's nothing to worry about and that he'll be back in a week. I hope this will pass. I will not allow myself to become a burden, not at my age. The only burden here should be my granddad. I won't allow myself to become weak, no matter what Dr. Gaynor says. Sure, I'm only a young one. Can't be that much harm at my age, right? It has been three months since my sickness began. Dr. Gaynor had run more tests. He told me I had a cancer in the blood. He said that there was no way to treat it here or anywhere close to home that I could go. Imagine that. Me and mom packed my overnight bag for me to be ready to go off to Dublin and be treated in their cancer ward. I don't know how long I will be there for. Mom is hopeful of me coming out okay, but she cries when she thinks I'm not looking. I don't know what she thinks, but sometimes I cry too, because of the uncertainty of when I will get better and can move on with my life. Why has this all come to an end? I've been in bed for weeks now with uncontrollable pain and sickness. He couldn't even say what was wrong with me or why me. All he could say was God works in mysterious and cruel ways. That does not answer my question. <coughs> so I was preparing for my big journey up to Dublin to the hospice. Mum and Dad had come to see me off. I told Mum I still can't wait for my birthday. In those days, we didn't have money for toys or presents. A roof over your head, food and clothes, was a yearly gift. It was just the times. The 
The journey was very long, going from bus to bus and spending my money wisely to only use on bus tickets. So many times I passed out on buses and had to be helped onto the steps like a helpless pup. But eventually I arrived in Temple Street Hospital. I walked in and introduced myself to the receptionist and explained who I was. Dr. Gaynor had sent them a letter to let them know that I was arriving. The nurses are lovely here, but strict on taking care of us and making sure we get our medicine and follow the treatments. I don't know anyone here, so I just spend my days on my own now, with the only company of nurses giving me pill after ointment after medicine, day in, day out. I'm the only child in this ward of my age. They are all older than me, even adults. I don't feel like talking to them, as I wouldn't know what to say. My birthday is coming up soon though. I'll be 13 come tomorrow. And it'll be the first time I've had a birthday on my own. Well, they're at home and I'll be here. I think I think I want to lie down now. I'm feeling tired. Hey Alice, I was told by Dr. Gaynor that it's your birthday today. We should get something sweet in for dinner today. And we got a letter from your mother. Look. Isn't it lovely, Al uh, Alice? You awake, child? Oh my God!